This is a day the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. And thank God for our young people today who are serving and uh, for those who were baptized on uh, this morning. As we continue in our uh, missions, evangelism, um, emphasis month, I would like to um, ask that you turn your Bibles to the third chapter of Exodus and the first uh, verses one through five. And while you're turning, uh, all you coming with your fasting. Amen. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's good to know that we're in day 16 of our 40 day journey. And uh, you can make it. You can make it to number 40. And. Uh, I was talking to someone, and uh, well, I'm talking now while you're turning, but that's the, it's the second book of the Bible, so just, uh, that some people fast so many hours a week from television, and they read, you know, they read something else, um, not Jet or anything like that, but read something more informative and nurturing. So that might be a good fast for some of y'all who are getting, joining us on this 40-day journey. Okay. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. One day Moses was taking care of Jethro's flock. Jethro was the priest of Midian and also Moses' father-in-law. When Moses led the flock to the west side of the desert, he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire coming out of a bush. Moses saw that bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. So he said, I'll go closer to this strange thing. How can a bush continue burning without burning up? When the Lord saw Moses coming to look at the bush, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Then God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. Amen. Amen. This is my Bible. Bible. God's holy word. word. There's a lamp unto my feet feet. and a light unto my path. path. Grass grass withers, the flowers fade. The word of our God shall stand forever. This is my Bible. This is my weapon. The sword of the Spirit. Amen. And I wanted to um, kind of emphasize our responsibility during these 40 days of Lent to Uh, not only focus on missions, but our witness to be evangelists for God. And so uh, I wanted to revisit this story and talk about any bush can burn. Any bush can burn. We're familiar with Moses. He is that patriarch, that, that pillar that stands tall in Hebrew history. He's that Old Testament figure and prophet known to most Bible readers. One whom God used in a very powerful and mighty way. He had strange beginnings, beginnings Oh, so different from how his life ended. He was born at a time in which his people were enslaved in the land of Egypt, enslaved for some 430 years. And as they grew, 
as a nation, the leadership of Egypt changed. One time it was accommodating, friendly, cursory, supportive leadership. But leadership changed and they were threatened, they being the Egyptian nation, were, they were threatened by this continually increase in the number of Hebrews who lived in their land. They assumed that if ever under attack from an enemy, if ever their land and country was invaded, that the Hebrews could and possibly align themselves with their enemies and therefore along with their enemies overthrow them. So they came up with a strategy, a strategy to, um, to practice birth control, if you will. But theirs were, their plan was a, a horrid plan. It was a horrific plan. It was infanticide. And so they issued a, a decree, an edict came from the throne of Pharaoh that every male child born was to be killed at the time of birth. And so this practice began in Egypt to kill all the male children. But when Moses was born, God and his providence intervened. The midwives refused to take this child's life. His parents hid him as long as they could. And then on one day they prepared a little a little ark, if you will, a little a little boat for him. And his sister aided in hiding him among the bulrush along the reeds, along the banks of the river, and she watched from a distance, keep an eye on him for his safety and for his care. And Pharaoh's daughter bathed in that particular spot, and one day she comes to go through her, her daily ritual, and God somehow caused the baby to cry. Upon hearing his voice, she sent for her maids to, uh, to fetch, I'm going to use that word, to fetch the baby. And she instantly, immediately fell in love with this child. She was wondering how we could take care of him, who could nurse him. And so Moses' sister stepped out of the shadows and said, I got somebody. I can find somebody. And Pharaoh's daughter said, well, yeah, then find someone to nurse him and tell them I will pay them to take care of him. And Pharaoh's sister, I mean, and Moses' sister took little Moses back to his mom. <laughs> and she nursed him as a mother will. But at some particular age, Pharaoh's daughter came back to claim him and brought him home, and he grew up in the palace, receiving the best education, receiving the best uh, social training that he could, etiquette, and not only that, but military strategies as he grew up uh, in the palace. Hebrews 11.25 says that although Moses had this lifestyle, although he lived not under the oppression of the Egyptians, he chose to identify with his own people. And on one occasion, he saw one of his fellow countrymen being abused and violated by an Egyptian. And Moses reacted. He did not respond, but he reacted to that and took the life of the Egyptian and buried the body in some sand. 
Then on another occasion, he saw two of his own countrymen quarreling and combating with one another. And as he tried to break up the, the fight, if you will, they said to him, like what people will do, they washed his face with his previous uh, yes, <laughs> with what they knew about him. They, they said to him, are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? And the word began to spread, and Moses, in fear, fled Egypt. Found himself wandering. He comes to this land of Midian. And he watches some young women take their flock to the watering place, only to be overrun and overpowered by some shepherds. And he came to their defense. Moses beat down those shepherds allowed the ladies to water their flocks first. And they ran home and told their daddy. So when they got home, the daddy said, you're home early. How you get home so early? Did you, did you water the flock? She said, yes, we watered the flock, but there's this man. This man showed up, and he beat down those shepherds that, that used to make us wait for hours and hours. And his, her, their daddy said, well, where is he? He said, well, we don't know. We left him there. He said, no, 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 no. You have to show kindness to someone who, who would do that for you. And they went and found Moses and brought him to their village, and to their home. And as he communed with them and dined with them, as time went on, he married one of Jethro's daughters. And so from the palace to the desert, leading an army to leading sheep. He's now residing in Midian, keeping his father-in-law's sheep. He's leading sheep occupationally, but emotionally and psychologically he's defeated. He's discouraged. He's disappointed. He's dry. He could be possibly depressed. He's unaware, totally oblivious to the life that God has planned for him. And he didn't realize at this time that he had been delivered to be a deliverer. He's oblivious to the future. That future of leading this multitude of people in their exodus from bondage to blessings. And the contrast is interesting. And that being, while Moses is consumed with monotony, God is busy. Arranging affairs and circumstances so that there can be an encounter with his future servant and emancipator. So what is God going to do? Because God has a plan. He has a purpose for this Moses. And so what is God going to do to arrest the attention of one that he desires to use. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. By what means shall he communicate with this potential patriarch and prophet? Through what channel of communication uh, shall he inform this man of his plans for his life? How shall this self-disclosure take place? 
Well, God, in his infinite wisdom, decides that he will use something ordinary. He chooses to use something common, something familiar. He chooses to use something conspicuous. He decided to use a bush. Not a rare bush. Not some extraordinarily exceptional bush. But just a plain, old, common, available bush. I said, any bush can burn. So God chose to use this bush. And I want you to know that any bush will do. Any bush will do. Here this bush was, minding its own business, <laughs> doing what bushes do. God decided that he was going to use it. And you know what? You may see yourself as insignificant, unnoticed, unqualified. However, God can use you. He can use you in your desert world. I think Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said that God chooses to use the foolish things to shame the wise. He's chosen to use the weak things to put to shame the things which are mighty. He's chosen to use the base things and the despised things and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And the reason he does it, as Paul writes in that first letter, verse 29 of that first chapter, he says, so that no flesh can glory in God's sight. So that no flesh can take the credit for what God does so that no credit can stand before God proudly thinking that they're all of that. So that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so, I want you to know that you're growing in the right place. You may be unaware of what God wants to do with you and through you. I said, any bush can burn, and any bush will do. And that's been God's track record. Joseph, when he was sold into slavery, into Egypt, he didn't know that God was going to use him to save a nation. When David was tending sheep, Samuel had been dispatched to Jesse's house, his daddy's house in Bethlehem, to find the next king, find and anoint the next king for, for Israel. David didn't realize at the time why he was tending sheep that he would be God's choice because all of his brothers looked like they were kingly material. Nehemiah.